I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bible to the book of Psalms, chapter 81. The book of Psalms, chapter 81. This is another one of those psalms that serves as a reminder to God's people. There's a glorious truth in the middle of it. It's a psalm that's, that, that's hard to classify. Some psalms are just straight doxology, uh, talking about all the great things about God. And then there are some psalms that uh, are kind of scary, <laughs> uh, imprecatory psalms where David is calling down the, the wrath of God upon enemies. You have lament psalms. This one's hard to classify because you have a little bit of, a little bit of lament, um, but there's a beautiful promise right in the middle of it that I want to I pull out for a few moments. Psalm 81, starting in verse 1. The word of the, Lord, of the Lord says this, Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Isn't it a blessing that God reduces Himself to be known as the God of Jacob? A liar. What kind of God is our God? He's a God of liars. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule for the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. He says, I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. He's speaking to these people, pointing back to the Exodus, to all the events of Egypt, and he's saying, remember all that I've done, and then hear my people. They, they hear those words, and they think Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He says, hear, my people, while I admonish you. O Israel, if you would but listen to me. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. He says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. And so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward Him, and their fate would last forever. But He would feed you with the finest of wheat. And with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Father, I pray that you would impress these words upon our heart, that you would help us to hear and listen. And as we listen, help us to believe and then live by. And we trust this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I certainly won't show, ask for a show of hands, but if you do watch the news, you're aware of the fact that the Powerball number is now up to over $1 billion. Silence. So apparently you haven't heard anything about that. Or you're just really convicted about that because you've got tickets back in your vehicle. $1 billion. You ever thought, what would you do with a billion dollars after taxes got a hold of it and you're still left with, you know, 30000 or so? <laughs> what would you do with a billion dollars? Better yet... Have you ever thought about what you would do with a blank check? Alyssa and Barry had to figure out what to do with a blank check. One night they went to dinner at Dr. Salami's restaurant in Pella, Iowa, several years back. Just another night, just another dinner. Left their two-year-old daughter at home. They're sitting there at the booth, and all of a sudden a strange gentleman in a sport coat walks over to them, stands over their table and asks them, Excuse me, do you have any children? Strange question. Barry and Alyssa look at each other and say, yes, as a matter of fact, we have a two-year-old daughter. Well, the man then reaches into his pocket, pulls out a checkbook, puts it on the table, signs his name in the bottom, tears it out of the book, presents it to Alyssa and says, you fill in the amount, I'm good for it. Turns around and walks out. What would you be doing? 
I'd be looking for cameras, man. This, this, there's, this is going to be on TV somewhere at some point, right? They didn't have a clue what to do. And so they just decided they would test it, and they wrote in the number 100,000, $100,000. The next day, they took it to the bank. Lo and behold, the check cleared. $100,000 richer. What would you do with a blank check? You see, that idea of a blank check comes to my mind when I read through verse 10. Specifically, the last part. When God says to His people, His wayward, ever-wandering people, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. He appeals to their appetites. See, that's something that I hope you remember for the rest of your life, that God doesn't command you to squelch your desires. You have desires, you have appetites, ambitions, and those are not to be suppressed. They are simply to be redirected towards the only one who can fulfill those desires. Now, He doesn't tell you to smush down the appetite and forget about the pangs of hunger and desire. No, He says, take them to the only one who will satisfy he appeals to their abilities. He says, open wide your mouth. He doesn't just heap blessing out upon those whose mouths are shut or full. We're involved in this. The command implies ability on our part and desire on His. He also appeals to our capacity. He says, open your mouth wide. I'm reminded that I will be filled with the presence of God to the degree that I'm open to Him. The question is not whether or not he, he has the de desire to fill us. The question is, how much of God do you want? You ever ask yourself that question? How much of God do you really want in your life? His word to us is, open your mouth wide, and I'll fill it. And that's the promise. What does it mean to fill? It means there's no room left. It means there's entire satisfaction it also means that it is no sin to glut yourselves on God. So how do we do this? Well, we do it by listening. We do it by hearing, by reading the Word. If you were here for our worship service this morning, our pastor talked about the, the necessity of the Word and prayer in the Christian's life. And tonight, I'm going, not going to segment the two of them. I'm not, I'm not going to differentiate between the role of the Word and the role of prayer because I believe they're equally important. You see, the Word is God's revelation to us. And we dare not be the kind of Christian that refuses to acknowledge God's revelation and instead create all kinds of different ways to respond that He never asked for. Instead, we take the revealed Word of God and then we live by it. And as we live by it, we pray it back to Him. God, You've said this and I'm counting upon this. And we turn it right back into prayer and worship. And so I believe that when we put ourselves in submission underneath God, we are opening our mouth wide so that He can fill us. We feast upon Christ through the Word. See, Jesus makes all of this possible for those of us who live on this side of the cross. This is fulfilled ultimately in the person of Jesus. And He says that in John chapter 6, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can have nothing to do with me. People were astounded by this. What does he mean? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Unless you believe in me. Unless you depend upon me. Unless you, you take every bit of me into your heart and your life. You can have nothing to do with me. What I want to look at tonight for just the next few moments are several ways, several benefits of feasting upon God. And I want to do that because as you leave tonight and as you go home to go to bed and get ready for Monday morning and all that that brings, I want you to be reminded of all that God is for you and all that He makes possible when you are challenged and frustrated and at the end of your wits. First of all, He fills us in giving us greater knowledge of God in Christ. Greater knowledge of God in Christ. He says to us, listen to me. He commands it twice, verse 8, verse 13. And he does this because we are to live by revealed truth, the Word of God both on the page and in person. 
That's how we live. Christians are people who don't invent ways to follow God. We simply look to the Word, both, on print, both in print and then the example of Jesus that we see in Scripture. And we also know that anything He requires of us, anything He commands, He also enables by the power of His Holy Spirit. That is a beautiful thing. He takes us out beyond our abilities because He expects us to not depend upon ourselves but upon His power. And why does He do that? He does that so that He will get the glory, so that people will see what happens through our lives and think so much more highly of who He is and what He wants to do through more and more people. God is glorified as He works through weak, common, ordinary people. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says this, that all of the promises that God ever made to His people find their yes, their exclamation point in the person of Jesus. If we are to enjoy this promise, then we do so in and through Jesus. He is the gate. He is the door. He is the way, the truth, the life. I ask you, in feasting upon God or in attempting to follow God or understand God, have you started at the right point? Are you more in love with Christianity than you are with Jesus? More in love with church than with, than, than with Christ? I ask you to consider that just because if we don't start with Jesus as the fulfillment, then the rest of the promises are not yet ours. All of God's promises made possible in the person of Jesus. When we feed upon the Word, we feed upon Jesus. I have um, I've never counseled a person who was struggling um, that was also spending consistent, abundant time in the Word of God. Any person I've ever counseled, when I dig deeper to find out what their devotional habits are like, almost inevitably, they're either spending no time in the Word or little time in the Word. And when we do that, when we, when, we, when we shut this book, when we shut this book, we essentially say to God, I, I, I don't need anything you have to say to me. I can make this on my own. I don't need any special revelation, no wisdom, no insight. I've got everything I need in this person right here. We're the ones that miss out. God is waiting to fill us up full to capacity. But when we open the book, and when we gaze intently upon the person of Jesus on these pages, and when we submit ourselves to Him, and when we ask to be transformed to be more like Him, God shows up. He fills us up full with His presence. He realigns our ambitions, all of our desires. He does all these other things. But it begins here. Second, He... First of all, he gives greater knowledge of God in Christ. Second, he also gives contentment in God, contentment in God. He says, open your mouth wide, I will fill it, I will satisfy, I will complete, I will fulfill. There's not a single promise that God ever makes that he leaves unfulfilled. Nothing lacking. I want to ask you, do you ever feel cheated? You ever feel like you're missing out? If so, then there's a strong probability that you're not finding contentment, you're not finding satisfaction in God. Because those who feast upon God find within their hearts that they lack nothing. Let me give you some scripture for that. Look down in verse 16. This is God's desire. He would feed you with the finest of wheat. With honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Elsewhere in the Psalms, you have this in chapter 34, verse 10. The young lions suffer want and they hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Those who seek God lack nothing. And I think too often we've taken, kind of to use Bill's analogy about the fast food restaurant, we don't want to work for in seeking God. We want to sit back in our spiritual easy chairs and just expect God to work on our behalf. 
And then we get upset when He doesn't come through, when our plans are frustrated, when our feelings are hurt. God, where are you? We haven't sought Him. We've taken a totally passive approach. And we can't afford to do that as believers. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, that this process of becoming more like Jesus and growing in our faith, it's, it's a both and. We work out our fear, or we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who is at work within us. Psalm chapter 84, verse 11. The Lord is a sun and a shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does He, we, does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean they win the lottery. It doesn't mean that all of their all of their problems and all of their troubles go away. It doesn't mean that all of their family circumstances are all of a sudden just magically worked out. But what it does mean is that God gives them every single thing that they need to persevere, even in the middle of difficult circumstances. Psalm chapter 63, verses uh, 1 through 5. This has become a favorite passage of mine in the last year. Psalm 63, he says, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. That satisfaction, that sitting down at a spiritual buffet that is multiplied times better than Texas State Brazil and enjoying infinite amounts of more pleasure and satisfaction. Matthew 5, 6, Jesus himself says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst continually. They keep hungering, they keep thirsting for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Those who seek God with sincere and open hearts will never be disappointed. That's the promise that we have in Scripture. Third, how exactly does God fill us? He fills us full of peace, both with God and in God. Peace with God is brought about when we believe in Jesus, when there are amends made in that relationship. Peace in God is maintained when we depend upon Him alone. Now, when we talk about peace, I want to make sure that we get an accurate definition of what peace is and what it's not. A lot of times we think that peace is just an absence of warfare, that there's some kind of stillness either in the heart or in the land. And it definitely includes that, but it's so much more than that. I love the way that Cornelius Plantinga uh, refers to this biblical idea of peace in his, uh, in his book, Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. He says this, that the webbing together of God... Humans and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight is what the Hebrew prophets call shalom. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed, a state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other ways, in, in other words, is the way things ought to be. Shalom is Eden, right? Everything right, everything flourishing unhindered productivity and joy. That's the kind of peace that God makes possible for us. The good thing here is that we can be walking through hell on earth but yet be unfazed because we can have Eden in our hearts because of the peace that God makes possible by His Holy Spirit. 
right? Don't be anxious about anything, Paul says, but in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you know that flourishing? Right? Do you, do you know that the way things ought to be? Do you know that in your heart? Do you experience that? God makes that possible for you in the person of Jesus and by the power of His Holy Spirit. There is no need for us to wander around constantly feeling like we're being drowned in drama. The fourth thing that I believe uh, God does here when He says, open wide your mouth and I will fill it, I believe that He fills us with joy, joy in God. To be filled by God is to have your heart aligned to His, which keeps getting greater perspective. We can't have our heart aligned with God, but yet still see things from the same sinful, selfish, self-oriented angle. Our ambitions will be changed, right? Our desires changed. When I think of examples in Scripture, I, I, I think first of all of, of Paul in the book of Philippians. Paul is under house arrest in Rome. Philippians write to them right out of the gate. He says, you know, I hear that there are people who are preaching the gospel and they, have, they don't have the best of motives for this. But yet I go on rejoicing because the message, message is getting out. Essentially, he's in prison. But yet in the middle of prison... He writes word time after time after time. I think there's around 106 verses in the book of Philippians. And 15 or 16 times he uses that word joy. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. You think, man, I sure would like some of that joy. God, can you give me joy? God, will you give me peace? I think that's the way we pray a lot of times, isn't it? We pray for God for these experiences. We pray for these blessings. Almost as if God is just a, a slot machine or a candy machine that just hands out, dispenses blessings when we ask for them. Do you ever think to stop and ask God, would you give me more, God? Would you fill me more full of yourself first? Knowing that every other blessing that will, will come along with him. Psalm 16 verse 11 is a is a favorite of mine. You make known to me the paths of joy, and in your presence is fullness of joy forevermore. You make known to me the paths of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy forevermore. You see, when we pray and we ask God, God, will you show me your glory? Will you give me more of yourself? Will you fill me full of your Holy Spirit? Will you teach me of your ways in Scripture? He brings all the other blessings along with him. And so we rejoice like Paul does because of his goodness, because of his faithfulness, because of his attention that he shows to us when we don't earn or deserve it. He is not indebted to us. We are not owed anything by him. But yet he continually, graciously gives. We're also grateful for the victory that he makes possible. You see later on in this chapter, verse 14 He says, I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. That's what we want. We want victory. We want help. But too often we bypass God. God, will you do this for me? Do you have your mouth open wide? Here's another, another benefit of feasting upon God. When we open wide our mouths, He fills it with the fullness of His Holy Spirit. See, when a person is born again, the presence of Jesus takes up residence within them. But yet many Christians still walk around with stunted spiritual lives because while He is within them, He is still not, as as Paul says in Galatians, I believe it's chapter 4, He is still not fully formed within them because Christians have blocked Him off from different areas of their life. 
And so in praying for the fullness of the Spirit, we should also be praying, God, would you please reveal any hidden sin in my life where I'm, where I'm stiff-arming you, I'm keeping you away. And then He fills us up with His presence. And He does that. He, he reflects His character through us when He does that. And He testifies to the power of Jesus. That's, that's what the fruit of the Spirit is about, right? When He fills us up full of His presence, all of a sudden, the love of Jesus and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. They just start bleeding out of us so that people should be around us and think more highly of Jesus because of what they see. Which leads to the next point. He also, he fills us with transformation into Christ-likeness. He transforms us. The more we take in of Him, the more we become like Him. There's an old saying, you are what you eat. (laughs) And so if you are feeding upon the Word, you will be transformed by this Word. Seven. Just two more. When we open our, our mouths wide, He fills us up. And that leads to influence with other people. Influence with others. That's not something that you have to manufacture. That doesn't require you to work angles and getting to know the right people. It simply requires you to show up and let Jesus shine through your character, the character that He's transforming. Christians are walking billboards testifying to realities about God. Therefore, when Christians walk around with a sour look on their face and shoulders hunched over, they don't testify well of a God who is sovereign and wise and good and full of joy and delight. A God who satisfies much is a God who is longed for by more people. I think that's one of the reasons that so many people want to have very little to do with the church because we have become known as people who protest coffee cups. Not people who are crazy about Jesus reflecting His character to the world around us. We must learn to pick better hills to die on. A God who satisfies little is a God that's ignored or despised. See, our delight and productivity, they reflect a satisfying, strengthening, glorious God. Our greatest good is tied up in that, and He gets the glory for it. And and see, and difficult experiences and difficult circumstances don't undermine this plan. Read 2 Corinthians. Paul's authority and apostleship is being questioned by this church that he has devoted a great bit of his ministry to. They don't want to have anything to do with him. He's preaching from a position of weakness. He talks about his hardships later on in the book. But I love what he says in chapter 4. I go back to this a lot when I feel like I'm lacking energy, when I'm running out of steam, when I'm discouraged. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible to go to when I'm discouraged. 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 7. Well, actually, I want to read verse 1 to you. He says, having this ministry by the mercy of God. Can I just stop there for a second and and just encourage you with this? Wherever you are in life and whatever you're doing, whatever ministry God has given to you, He has given that to you because He loves you, not because He's angry with you or because He's putting you on the bench, right? There's not necessarily sin in your life that's keeping you from more. He says, we have this ministry because God loves us. And because of that, because I'm reminded God has placed me right here because He loves me, I'm not going to lose heart. But he goes on in chapter 7. We have this treasure, talking about the Holy Spirit, the transforming power of Jesus. We have this treasure in jars of clay. The thing about jars of clay is they crack, they break. And the more they crack and they break, the more they reveal what's on the inside. We have this treasure to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. 
We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us. Trials are coming. Circumstances are coming. It is not fun. It is painful. But yet the more it comes, the more the power of Jesus comes out. And people are watching. How in the world do they make it? How are they able to stand? How are they able to to smile? It's the power of Jesus. And Paul says in verse 15, it is all for your sake, so that, the, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Let's just acknowledge that this is not the godly nation that it either was or we wish that it would be. And we have to decide as a family and as a church across the country, we have to decide as as individuals, are we going to whine about it? Or by the grace of God, will we depend upon God to empower us to live in treacherous days? Let's not live as victims. Let's instead live because Jesus has made the victory possible for us. He has done everything necessary to make us victors. Last point, when we open wide our mouths and we're filled by God, it results in greater hunger for God. He is an endless sea of delights for those who will swim in Him. He says, open your mouth wide, ever wider, and I will fill it. The more you get, the more you want. The more you want, all you have to do is open wider and He fills you more. And see, I think that's what the people of Israel in this day forgot, and I think that's what the church today tends to forget. Is that we can always have more of God. The question is, how much do you really want? Because people who feast upon God don't forget about Him. And they don't turn from feasting upon the buffet that He is to nibble on dirt. Right? That was the, that was the sin in Jeremiah's day. My people have committed two evils. They have... They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. People who feast on God realize that man doesn't live on bread alone, but he lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so there's a couple of questions I'd want to ask you as you close out this weekend and get ready for Monday in light of all that God longs to do for you, in light of all that God has made possible by the power of His Holy Spirit, in light of His big plan of getting the gospel to all nations and involving you in that, in light of all that He desires to do, can you afford to open your mouth? Can you afford not to open your mouth wide to Him? Is He not worth more than just sips and nibbles. Now let's open wide our hearts to Him and allow Him to fill us in a way that only He can. Let's seek Him more through the Word than we ever have before. And let's humbly but deliberately live out the implications of what we see. Are you taking in Christ to the degree that He offers Himself to you? I mentioned earlier Barry and Alyssa to you. $100,000 richer. It's a dangerous game to play. But I wonder if they've ever gone back in time and just thought, man, I wonder if we would have put a two instead of a one. What would have happened? Mm, What if we would have put an extra zero? That's big time. I mean, the man said, fill in the amount. I'm good for it, right? They were limited by two things. I think we're limited by the same two things. They were limited by the size of their request and their belief that the account holder could make good on it. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have a promise here from God that if we open wide our mouths, He will fill them. Let me pray for us. As we pray now, I want to ask you while, you while you're seated in your seat and this room is quiet to meditate upon this truth and ask the Lord, is my heart open wide to you? Our pastor has said it before and it is so true. This is a Sunday night group. So many loyal, faithful Christ followers in this room. But is it possible that you haven't started at step one and first believed on Jesus and seen Him as the key to all that God promises. The first step in this journey is to repent of independence from God, to believe that Jesus is the Christ of God, that He has come to restore that relationship, and by believing upon Him, the sacrifice that He has made on our behalf and the life that He makes possible, that we can be restored to God. And then receive the free gift of salvation that God makes possible. Father, I pray tonight that you would help us to live in light of this truth. You have made this promise that if we will open wide our mouths, if we will feed upon you, that you will fill us. And there's so many desires, so many hurts, so many circumstances. And I pray that we would just not listen to them for a minute, not, that you would give us perspective and help us to see you in your person as the answer, knowing that you will bring with you everything that we need for any circumstance. I pray that you will stir within our hearts to want to live in light of this truth, and that we will take that blank check that you have offered to us, and we'll fill in god size amounts, trusting in you to do what only you can do, and so much more. And we trust this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.